Welcome to Profiling at the Movies. I just had a request from one of my subscribers. They said, what do you think of Mindhunter? I want to know what you think of Mindhunter as a profiler. And I actually have never seen Mindhunter. Uh, this is Netflix's Mindhunter. So I went and watched season one. And you may wonder, why wouldn't I have watched this? Because everybody said it was a magnificent show about serial killers and the FBI profiling. But as a profiler, you know, it's one of those things where if you're a lawyer, you don't want to watch lawyer shows. And if you're police, you don't want to watch police shows. And as a profiler, most of the time I'm rolling my eyes when I'm watching any show that involves profiling. So quite frankly, I don't do that. So since I was asked, I spent, I did, I, I spent one good day watching all 10 shows of season one. And some of it I liked very much. And the number one reason I liked it, the number one reason is, you know, it was kind of funny because as I'm watching the show, I'm going, nah, nah, nah. and then all of a sudden I'm like, dang, that's right, right on. What, why am I so like, thinking this is, is, is correct. And it started with Ed Kemper when, when he came in to talk. Um, I, all of a sudden I'm going, this seems like Ed Kemper. This seems like something he would actually say. And then I found out they really did use the interviews to, 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 to uh, recreate in Mindhunter. And that's why it seems so real to me. And it seems so accurate to me. It was like, wow, this, 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 is, this is it. So I'm, at the end of this, you're gonna see what my rating is for the serial killers in this show, but I'll have to say Ed Kemper. I mean, gosh, was he right on the money? I mean, even a little bit scarier, but still right on the money. So if you watch this show for no other reason than Ed Kemper, watch it for Ed Kemper because it was quite awesome. But anyway, let me get started with my profiling of the show. Now, as usual, my profiling is not to be about whether I like the show's you know the the acting or whatever in the show that's uh, or whether that kind of stuff that's that's why i'm not i'm not doing the normal type of uh you know review of a show where where you're saying oh this is this show was so much fun to watch i give it a 10 or this show sucks so i give it a zero i'm only dealing with profiling and how i think profiling and criminals are represented in television and in the movies so here we are with mindhunter which was a very popular show on netflix so let me go forward with it and I'll be looking off to my left because I made a shitload of notes because it was 10, <laughs> it was 10 shows. And I'm not even saying I wrote the notes terribly well over here. So if I suddenly stop and go, what was I even, what? Excuse me, but I'm, I'm trying to give you a rundown of the show and trying to hit all the major points that I thought were really interesting in the show. So let's start out. In the, the beginning, we have episode one. We have Holden Ford, um, who is representing actually John Douglas. John Douglas, the FBI profiler. That's who he represents in the show. Holden Ford. And he's he meets a guy named uh, Peter Rathman. He's a professor. And he's giving this, uh, this, this talk about David Berkowitz, son of Sam. And he's fascinated by what Rathman has to say. And so what he says is... Um, Rathman says, when you're trying to find a motive, it's like you're just looking into a black hole. And and at that, Hol, Hol, uh, I'm going to call him Holden in this. We'll go with Holden because that's his first name. So Holden goes, oh, how can that be? How can we just have a black hole? There must be something more. And so basically, the, Rathman is trying to say, where do we go when, when, when the motive is elusive? In other words, you can't figure out what the motive is. And you know, my, my answer to that is, which may be surprised some of you, Stop trying. <laughs> Stop trying. You know, motive really doesn't matter. Um, if you're trying to stop people from becoming killers uh, or do other, you know, other violent crimes, and you want to look into the psychology from when they're a little baby all the way up to try to stop the progression, I'm good with that. But once you become a psychopath, it's not so much about what your motive is because your motive is always the same. And I, 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 I must say this, Anytime I do any show. So you're like, she said that before. Power and control. The reason all people do anything in life is generally speaking for power and control and for recognition. I mean, that's all of us. I mean, do you really want to live a life where you don't have any power, any control? Nobody pays any attention to you? I mean, that sucks. I mean, we don't want that. Luckily, for most of society, we're taught how to gain these things in a good way. We're taught to be nice and then people will like us. We're taught to work hard and then we'll get some power and control. And But with serial killers and mass murderers and other, other psychopaths like terrorists, they don't get their power and control through legal ways. 
and they don't and they don't know how to get it in a normal life. They just they just don't. So serial killers go off on this weird way where they they have a fantasy. They have some fantasy or other. And we all have fantasies, mind you. And people don't want to admit it, but even when you talk about sexual fantasies, I mean, there's some people like this and there's some people who are like that and they fantasize this and then they want to do that because that's their thing. Well, with serial killers, that's their thing. They have fantasies about how they're going to get power and control in a way that is extraordinarily exciting and makes them feel like God. And they just have different methods of doing that. Uh, but the, pro the whole point of them is power and control. And when you start trying to understand their motives, you do go into a black hole. It's like, really? You know, do you, what, what other motive is there except power and control? So just don't waste your time. But I am kind of, now, I'm not, not everybody's in agreement with me on that because they do want to know more and more and more and more, more. And this show gets into the issue of let's find out about motive. So at any rate, we have now Holdman and Rathman get together. They, um, they, they have this weird thing where they're, they're having a drink at the bar and they say, you know, crimes have changed over time. You know, really? Because if you go back in history, you'll find a lot of freaky crimes. I mean, a shitload of freaky crimes. Why is that? Because there are. I mean, people are people. Humans are humans. Now, they have different ways of expressing those crimes over time, depending on their abilities. Like if you go back uh, 2,000 years in, 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 in history, no, you're not going to have a mass murder with a, with, a, uh, with a firearm because they didn't have firearms. <laughs> you, know? you have mass murders with people stabbing like 60 people. You know? So that happens in the middle of the night. <laughs> you know? and, uh, or, or people have massive wars and they get to get all their expressions out during the war. But people have always committed crimes and creepy crimes and rapes and horrible horrible things. But we also didn't have newspapers way, way back in time. And then we had local news. And local news only told us, oh, one little bad thing here, one little bad thing there. Now we've got national news and we're collecting the information from all over the United States and all over the world every minute of the day. So now, of course, oh my God, we've got all these weird crimes. Well, not really, but now we know about the weird crimes. So I think that's kind of crazy that they think that there weren't weird crimes back then. Uh, then Holden says, the world doesn't make any sense. So crime doesn't either. What? <laughs> yeah, you know, so when all, when all of this occurred back in the 80s, which is now, let's see, oh, we're talking 40 years ago, the world didn't make any sense. Well, okay, so the world made sense in what? 1860? The world made sense when? When did the world make sense? And now it doesn't make sense. And of course, we still have serial killers, so I guess the world still doesn't make sense. So well, I guess we're screwed because it'll never make sense. But he seems to think that serial killers have gotten worse because the world doesn't make sense. My feeling is we just know more about serial killers and we have more news. And that's why we know more about it. All right, let's look on. So at any rate, um, Durkheim, and this, this, is, this, is a, this is a sociologist, says that if there's something wrong with society, then it increases criminality. Okay, I'm going to go with that. There is a truth to that. When you have a society at peace, when when they have enough food, where they have enough, that good things are going for it. Uh, families are, are, are not falling apart. Um, there's not too much strife in the society at that moment. True, we don't have as much crime because we don't have as many angry people who are also out of power and control. And when things go downhill, yes, that's true. I will agree with that. But it's not because everything was great at the dawn of man and now everything is crazy and we, we are all completely screwed. It's it's just that we have ups and downs in all of history. And you can look back in history and see some pretty nasty times. And then there's some times which seem pretty good. But also things are good at this point part of the world and things suck over here. So while you're having a happy life over here, these people are all getting you know brutally murdered over here. There's some kind of you know some genocide thing going on. Or even in our own country. Like I grew up in the 1950s and you know that white pick offense? I had it. I mean, I had a, a family that stayed together. My father made good money. Um, nobody drank, nobody do, did drugs in my family. I had that life. I mean, everything was pretty nice, but across town, somebody's life might not be so good. They might have a difficult life. Maybe their, their father died early. Maybe the mother's on drugs. Maybe they live in a bad community. So while I was having a great life, somebody over here wasn't having such a fine life. We didn't have much crime near where I lived, but there was probably crime, more crime across town. So just re to be realistic, Life isn't perfect and and no time is perfect and no place is perfect. So I, I just find that kind of, so I'll agree with Durkheim in that sense. Crime, criminality does maybe increase in times that things aren't so good. 
So anyway, we go on here now. So, oh, and now, now Holden, this guy's a new girlfriend. Um, and I'm not going to say much about the girlfriend because I personally, the one thing I didn't like about this show was <sighs> I didn't like all the personal stories. I thought they were kind of annoying. Um, I really like, let's not even do that. We'll just leave them out because they're all kind of stupid. So anyway, he, he hooks up with this chick and she's kind of like, Oh, she's kind of cool. And he's kind of, mm, you know, and so she gets into a soak, smoke weed. And I'm like, you're in the FBI and you're smoking weed. So, cause that's a problem even getting into the FBI if you smoke weed, but now you're in the FBI and you're really, really, I mean, I just thought that was kind of stupid. So, and all right, now, now he's in the FBI. And this is about the time that the behavioral science unit is being created. And mind you, um, it's now called the behavioral analysis unit instead of the behavioral science unit. It's kind of funny to me because some people say, is profiling an art or a science? And in my opinion, it should be science. And it should be science because I do deductive profiling, which means base everything on evidence and don't make up any stuff out of, out of statistics or whatever. So, but a lot of the FBI agents actually said it was an art. Uh, because they were doing this inductive profiling, which said, I can imagine things and I can look back and, oh, I've studied serial kills. So I imagine he's this and that. I'm like, that really is art and doesn't belong, in my opinion, in law enforcement. But that's where I have a big disagreement with the FBI. Uh, I believe in deductive profiling. The FBI has done mostly inductive profiling. I'm not fond of their profiling methods. They don't like me. So there we go. Uh, <laughs> you know, the world isn't perfect. So anyway, I want to talk about the, uh, the BSU. Um, it was started with Howard Teton and uh, Mike, uh, Patrick, well, I know I'm not going to say it, Rhett Mulaney. Uh, they're not in the show. And they had about 10 agents in the beginning. Uh, and in uh, 19, later in 19, what, what time did this actually, 1976 is saying here? I'm trying to look at my notes here. Anyway, Robert Ressler, um, who is being played in this in this show by John Tench. Robert Ressler was really the guy that got this thing going. And Douglas came in later. So we all hear about Douglas, 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 John Douglas, Douglas, Douglas. And the real reason is he's got a good publicity machine. Um, and that's the way life works again. Uh, you know, Hollywood and, uh, and, and uh, loves, loves something that they can sink their teeth into. And John Douglas was that guy that provided all of that for them. So I just want to point, I want to show you a couple books. Um, this, this is the book, of course, you saw on the screen when I came in. This is John Douglas's book, Mindhunter. And this had a huge impact. People read and read and read this. And they loved the heck out of this book because he made it very exciting, chasing serial killers and getting getting into his mind. And oh, it's so creepy, creepy, creepy. They love this book. My, I personally, not overly fond of it. I will go with Robert Ressler's book, Whoever Fights Monsters. And I believe Robert Ressler was one of the better profilers in, in existence. Um, he, he, used a lot of deductive techniques along with the inductive. So I really respected a lot of what Robert Ressler did. Uh, he didn't get near the publicity as Douglas. Uh, maybe he just wasn't as good at you know, promoting himself. But I, if you're gonna read something that really is much more FBI, but, uh, but, but really reasonable, I'd go with this one. Now, I also have a book which is called The Profiler, My Life Hunting Serial Killers and Psychopaths. <laughs> a lot of people don't like this book, and I'm going to admit it. Um, if you go to Amazon and you want to read my book, you'll see a lot of hate, a super lot of hate. And you know what they say? She's not an FBI profiler, so what the hell is she even doing writing this book? And, and you know, she, did, she worked on all these cases, but they didn't seem to go to court. That's just true. And the funny thing is I wrote this book, and they also they don't like the title, I, My Life Hunting Serial Kills and Psychopaths. Well, you know, I didn't pick the title. That, that comes from the, um, the publisher. Mine was A Woman's Fight for Justice, but that got tossed. And they made this one with a creepy, creepy, creepy knife here, you know, see, creepy knife. And and I went right front in the, right, in the beginning of the book, I immediately said, I'm not an FBI profiler. And what I'm doing is talking about how to profile crimes and why these cases, when you when you profile cold cases, rarely go to, um, rarely go to court and rarely get actually, somebody gets prosecuted for it. So they end up being quote unsolved, even if you've solved them. And I'm gonna talk more about that when I talk about the FBI profiles, but guess, guess what? People think they solve tons of cases. They don't. They don't. They they assisted police by giving profiles to them. And other than that, most of the profiles really didn't help police out. And they actually didn't. The cases weren't solved until 30 years later when and a D, there was a DNA match. And then they took credit, a lot, of, a lot of credit for it in the books and in the movies. So you say, oh, my God. But if you actually look at the track record, FBI profiling has come into. Well, there's some really nasty things written these days about profiling where where. Articles have come out in 
you know, like the New York Times and other places and saying profiling is garbage. Um, the FBI prof the profiling has never worked. They haven't solved cases. Serial killers never got caught by their profiles. And they're generally speaking accurate about that. They haven't been caught by the profiles because the profiles were so created out of the head and so vague that it's like 50% of it matched and 50% of it didn't match. And then the guy was never caught from the profile. He was caught from, he had a body in his car when somebody stopped him, a police officer stopped him, or or 30 years later, the DNA match. And that is the number one way cold cases get solved. And so if you come in and work on a cold case, and that's what I did three to four years later, 10 years later, 15 years later, I could figure out who did it. I could lay out all the evidence. I could give that to the, the detectives and they go, wow, thanks. Let's hide this because we can't go to court with it because we don't we don't have any evi the evidence to actually pursue it now. Uh, we, we can agree with her and think, wow, that was an excellent analysis of the case. We can't go to court, so we're just not gonna talk about it. My book is honest. And some people don't like honest because they love the FBI profiling. <laughs> they love the, the mystique. They love all the creepiness. And so they're really into FBI profiling. And um, the FBI is not fond of me not being, you know, not supporting their, their concept of profiling. And so, of course, I don't, I'm, I'm usually called, um, I believe we call that self-made profiler or that TV lady. That's what I get called. But when I look at, when, I, when I'm going to t tell you a lot in this particular series, you'll see where, where I'm coming from. Okay, so, so let's go a little further down here. Let's see. So we're still, okay, so anyway, Holden, um, he wants to go to psychology and get his degree because he thinks that will help in this whole concept of studying serial killers. He goes to UVA, he does that, and so on and so forth. So um, now there's one thing, by the way, a lot of people talk about, you know, one of the most popular stories is that John Douglas from the FBI uh, got together with Ted Bundy and Ted Bundy, he he talked to him and Ted Bundy gave him a profile. And you see this in Sir, uh, Silence of the Lambs, that concept, you, you know, you go to and you get a serial killer who's smart to tell you how another serial killer is going to behave and he'll profile. And it's, it's mostly nonsense because that serial killer is just making up crap and he's fantasizing himself. So, and it, and it was over this, uh, where's, where's my book on it? Go? Okay. So here, we have the river man, Ted Bundy. Oh, this is actually Keppel. Oh, wrong, wrong person here. But Keppel was involved too. So you got all these different different people involved in in uh, searching for the Green River Killer, talking to Ted Bundy. And so you get profiles going and talking to Ted Bundy, and he tells them. But guess what happened? Decades passed, and and uh, the Green River Killer wasn't found in all of those all that time. And eventually was found by DNA and some other uh, other things that caught him, but mostly DNA. And so again, we the profile the profilers did not profile the crime and, and, and catch the guy. As a matter of fact, it's interesting that um, Gary Ridgway um, eventually uh, was caught for this crime in 2001. So let's see, let's see, it was way, so we're talking at least 20 years later. Um, and what one of the interesting comments made was that the, um, where, where's my comment from the guy who, oh, here. Um, he, the, the guy that was in charge of the case said that uh, Douglas had had given a profile, but fr quite frankly, it didn't, didn't, didn't pan out to be anything, <laughs> you know. But yet, you'll see the book. You'll see the books come out and saying, it seems to get it all into the case and talk about it, but they're, they never show the profile, which is why you don't have to prove that you got it right or you got it wrong. That profile has never been shown. So you won't know. And, and that's how you, you keep it a secret. You know, so there you go. And you, you, you can't prove it. In my opinion, my profiles that I have done, uh, as a matter of fact, I've, I've made them in my book. I actually wrote down what my, my profile was. I'm not the exact profile I sent to the police, but the profile that I basically what the case was about. Uh, and but the profiles I give to the police, if they want to show those profiles, that's fine with me. You know, I mean, it's not a secret. Um, you know, I get, it stays with the police, but the police, if they want to prove something or whatever, they can do that. Uh, but if, you know, the FBI is putting out profiles and they're claiming that these profiles work to catch killers, why can't we see the profiles? You know, and I don't want to see the profiles 10 years later when you, you know, tweak them after the guy's been caught. I want to see them in the beginning and then who was it? And then let's compare them. As a matter of fact, I would think if you're going to do research and you're going to try to make a, a methodology that works, you would want to an analyze that and prove that it works. And if it doesn't work, then you want to you know, change your methodology. 
but uh, this has been going on for years and I, I don't know that the methodology has changed and I don't know that we ever have had any proof that these, these things actually work. So, um, so anyway, let's go on to, yeah, well, it says here, I wrote down, Gary uh, Ridgway didn't match his profile very closely. That's, that's, what the, that's what the guy who was running the case said. It didn't match. Um, and then there's another thing. In 1983, VICAP was also born. And if you're familiar with VICAP, is, VICAP is a methodology we put in what serial killers did at each one of these scenes if the police turned the information. And by the way, half the time the police departments never bothered to turn the information. And so <laughs> you're always kind of missing stuff. But when the police did, they would say, okay, what happened to the scene? Did the guy use a rock? Did he use a knife? Did he use a gun? What did he do? And then, then you're supposed to be able to match it to other scenes. But the problem was, the reason it's never worked out very well is that very few serial killers do anything that's so weird, that signature thing that was also developed during this period of time with the BSU, that, oh, they have a signature. You know, in other words, every time they do a crime, they leave, they're like an artist. No, they're not. They're like, like, like idiots who just do, do nasty stuff and walk away. Rarely. And once in a while, you know, you get the guy who cuts the woman's head off and sticks it on top of a bedpost or, or ties a bow like the you know, Boston Strangler. Very rarely. And you know, it's so rare that most of the time one scene looks like another scene. And sometimes one guy, just because he used a knife here doesn't mean he's going to use a knife the next time. I, I actually have seen some cases where of a serial killers where he went from using, he used like five different weapons over five different crimes because he did this one. It didn't work so well. So he tried a different one and that didn't work so well. So he went to a third one. I've seen guys change from inside a house to outside a house to one woman to two women. It, all kinds of weird stuff. And you, if you tried to match them, good luck, because they don't, they don't, they don't even look the same for the one guy. And then you have cases where five different cases look exactly the same and they're not the same guy. Because if you, if you jump out of the bushes and you hit somebody over the head and then strangle them and rape them, it pretty much looks like the next guy who jumped out of the bushes and hit somebody over the head, strangled them and raped them. So, you know, you can't say that, that that's connected. So you can only really connect crimes through DNA or sometimes through location, like in other words, if some guy keeps dumping the bodies in the same under the same tree in a forest, you know, and, and they're they're dumped there at different times, you can probably guess all four of those bodies that were dumped there were the same guy. But that's unusual too, and you know, because I don't think you're gonna have two guys dumping bodies in the same place. So that would tell you one guy. So you have it would have to be very specific things that would tell you this is the same guy. Um, so let's go on to oh. Oh, this is this was a strange thing to happen here. So anyway, um, so Holden's there, and John Tent shows up, and and Holden's doing this, this this he's teaching this class, and he's so over overly academic and philosophical. The the, the, the cops go, mm. you know, they're like not interested. They're just agents are just not interested. They're like bored. And and Tent Tench tells him, hey, just don't make it so complicated. John Tench. John says, don't make it so complicated. You're just boring the hell out of him. And that is very true because essentially you want something that works. You want specific methodology that works. Uh, and I'm working on developing a program for detectors right now that is specific methodology. They just don't need a whole bunch of fancy ideas like, do you know what happened with his mother? Who cares? Will that help me solve the crime? Or are we just talking crap? So, you know, maybe interesting to talk about, you know, uh, how to prevent these guys from developing. It may be just interesting talk, but does it help me solve the crime? And what, what detectives need and agents need is stuff that solves crimes. Um, okay, so anyway, um, so then he, uh, this is this is really an obsession with, uh, with, with Holden. He really wants to understand why the, why the guy did it. And that's what did lead to a lot of, uh, le led to this eventually. Um, let me find the book. The Crime Classification Manual, which was written by John Douglas and and um, Robert Russell and also Ann Burgess, who is played by the, the woman in the show who's a psychologist. They wrote this crime classification manual. And in my opinion, it does, they, it's supposed to be the motives. Like you got, oh, entitlement rate, profit motivated, vandalism. My opinion, that's, that's method of operation more than it is motive. The motive is still power and control, but you have different ways of getting it. That's your that's your method of operation. In other words, if if I want to be a oh I don't know, uh, yeah, a lot, some of these, wow, um, some of these are just in, in my opinion created in the minds of the profilers and in the psychologists more than actually what they think. For example, a guy kills a serial killer goes and he kills kills only prostitutes. Is he getting rid of prostitutes, or is, quite frankly, are they just easy to abduct and rape and kill? And the answer is they're really good targets because 
the prostitutes, one of the things that happens with prostitutes is that a guy, one of the Johns, because he's usually one of the Johns, he'll come along and he'll pick up Mary one day and he'll kick Mary out and he'll have sex with her and he'll return Mary with her money. And Mary says, Oh, hi, hi, Sandy. And Sandy goes, Hey, who'd you, who were you just with? Oh, I was with John. Oh, how was he? He was great. You know, and then next week, Sandy goes out with him. And then he has sex with Sandy and he sends Sandy home and, and, and she's fine too. And then one day he's driving along and he comes along Elizabeth, right? I'm putting nice names because usually something like, you know, some fancy hooker name, but I'm going to go with Elizabeth. So now he picks up Elizabeth, he take, and nobody's around. So nobody sees Elizabeth get into his car. And he goes, Eureka. Nobody saw her get into my car. He takes her away, he rapes her, and he murders her and dumps her body. And Elizabeth doesn't come home. And so when the police come and talk to the, to the ladies, they say, who do you think it could be? And they say, well, they say, what about this guy, John? And they go, oh, no. You know, we've been out with John. We always come home safe. So they don't suspect John because normally they return alive. And so they're very easy victims because they can you can just disappear with them. And then they disappear. And sometimes... People don't even look for them for a while because they assume they ran off or they went on, you know, there, a lot of ladies are on drugs. So then maybe they went off with, you get drugs. Maybe they went off with their pimp. Who knows? So it's sometimes tough to actually realize that they're, they've been raped and murdered unless they, they're found, their bodies are found. So they're a really good target. So, so they, but there was a theory that the, the guy would, and so what they do is they interview the dude and when they caught, if they caught him and they would say, why did you kill the women? Well, you, you could say just because I felt like it because it was fun, or you could say, because I don't like prostitutes, they're out there ruining society. Now, which do, which one do you think gets more sympathy? Saying they're ruining society. So now he's a mission-oriented serial killer. No, he isn't. He's just a serial killer. He's making up that crap. And you're giving him a motive of the mission when his motive was still power and control, and it was a lot of fun. So a lot of times I think this is just nonsense, and, and you can you can create scenarios, but and even the serial killers can tell you their motive, but they're usually lying anyway, so you can't believe them because they're pathological liars, and they want to play you. So let's go on to episode two, Ed Kemper. <laughs> okay, Ed Kemper. Now, I have to say, um, Ed Kemper in, the, in, 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 this, uh, in, in this show, oh my God. Oops, I'm sorry. I stopped by here. So in case you don't know who the guys are. So over here, we have our Holden guy who's representing John Douglas. And over here, we have our John Tench guy who's representing Robert Ressler. And I want to say it's kind of a funny thing. I just want to mention this. This show is so much about John Douglas. Um, Rep and Holden representing John Douglas. And he's the one that keeps pushing for everything, pushing for everything. He's the one that makes things happen. And Ressler who was being played, John Trench, his wrestler, he's always going, oh, I'm the old guy. I'm an old guy. I do things the old way. Yeah, it's not my idea. Not my idea. Hey, I'm sorry. Wrestler was there first. He he was the one that brought in John John Douglas over here. So, but Robert Wrestler, does, I said, doesn't have the publicity that, that Douglas got. So, and he's like, he's like, dead right now. So when this movie, when this series came out, he couldn't, he couldn't complain and say this was crap because he's dead. So, so basically he got, I think he was re poorly represented and it kind of bugged me uh, because I thought he, I really, I really like Robert Ressler and I just thought he got the kind of got a bad deal on this, but he said he's not around anymore to complain. So let's go on to the next one here. Okay. Our, our guy here. Okay. So we have, um, we have Ed Kemper. And when he walked in in this part, I swear to God, I just thought, Whoa, you nailed it on Ed Kemper. That is awesome. You know, uh, and it is because they took it straight from the interviews. And I went back and looked at interviews to see how much off it was and gave you the feeling of Ed Kemper. I say Ed Kemper's a little less scary in real life, but the, he portrayed it extremely well. And so if you're going to I say, if you know other reason you want to see the show, watch it for Ed Kemper. And the, the the portrayal of it. This guy deserves an award. I don't know if he got an award, but he did a fabulous job. So that was absolutely true. Um, so and then we have in here in this particular show we have um, that this was again the idea of Holden to go talk to Kem to, to uh, Kemper, and then he was going to like push push John Tension to seeing him. That's garbage. In reality, it was it was. Robert Ressler, who was being played by John Tench, uh, and that's a character in the show, he was the one that saw Ed Kemper first. And the second time he went, he brought his colleague, John Conway, and he brought John Douglas. So it was all about Robert Ressler doing this, not John Douglas. And again, not portrayed the opposite way. 
which kind of just annoys me. Anyway, uh, the one one thing mentioned here is that losers are drawn to authority. They want to be they want want to be cops, and that is absolutely true. Um, they love the uniform. They love the concept of authority because that's power and control. The problem for these guys is they can't get it because if they try to join the police force, they can't pass the psych test usually, and they can't get in. Uh, I've always joked about security guards being the number one job of serial killers, but actually it's not a joke. It's actually true. Uh, they like, because you can become a security guard and sometimes even a, an armed security guard and get a, and not have to pass a, a test. So you know, I always tell ladies, you know, when the security guard asks you if you want him to walk you to your car in a dark parking lot, maybe not, <laughs> maybe not. Now I have, I'll say that having had, um, I have had uh, my own, uh, People in my family have been security guards. So not everyone is a, a psychopath as a security guard. But I'll tell you, if you talk to any non-psychopathic security guard, he'll go, yeah, that guy over there, dang, if he ain't a psychopath. So, so yeah, it's a job that they love. So you will find that. Um, and so when Ed, 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 Ed Kemper, uh, Kemper comes in and talks here, um, yeah, it's the first time this seemed real to me. Um, and the funny thing that really, that really stuck in my head was Holden sitting there with a pen and he doesn't have a tape recording this, he's having a pen. And I'm just thinking, Kemper's just gonna reach across, grab that pen and stab you in the eye. <laughs> I just kept waiting for that to happen because uh, pens can be very dangerous. Uh, so later on, no, uh, Holden did have a tape recorder, but I've always wondered about, you know, pens around these guys, it just creeps me out. I've actually seen, you know, there are actually circumstances in like mental hospitals and also regular hospitals where a person, a guy will lean over like a security, might for the hospital might lean over a patient who is who his only one hand is locked up because he took the other hand off so the person could go to the bathroom and then that person will can reach out and actually grab the pen out of that per, that guard's pocket so i'm scared of pens because they suck when they go in your eye you know so anyway holden says you seem like a nice ordinary guy it's difficult for me to square you with what you are in prison for that is actually very true because this is what happens during police investigations so the so the police detective is there and the guy comes in who is the killer and he interviews him and he goes, seems like a normal guy to me. You know, we had a nice, I thought we chat about football and stuff like that. It just seems like a normal guy. And since he seems normal to me, I can't imagine, I wouldn't do stuff like this. So therefore I can't imagine him doing stuff like this. And that is exactly why serial killers get away with what they get away with. Generally speaking, you may, if you live with him, you know, kind of get to the point, you know, they're a psychopath. If you work with them, you kind of get creeped out by them eventually. But sometimes when you're just meeting them, like a girl runs into a guy or he comes in and says, hey, can I help you with your groceries? You go, oh, he seems like a nice enough guy. Yeah, because he can, for a period of time, seem normal. And and, and in reality, you know, a, a serial killer and a psychopath, they, they don't kill every day. So they have normal days, you know, they do everything we all do. We get up and they make, you know, they make themselves a little breakfast and, and they go to work and they chat with people and they talk about football and they, they go home and watch a movie. I mean, they do what norm, normal people do until they kill. So yes, that is one thing that's difficult for detectives sometimes when they're talking to them to even recognize that they're psychopaths and sitting in front of them is the actual killer. So that's that's amazing how that works. Um, and they, there's a claim, they, he claims he gave himself because he despaired of ever being caught. Well, there's a lie and a half. There is no serial killer that wants to get caught. Believe me, never, never, never. They only, they only confess or give themselves up when they know, they know you've already got them. In other words, they're trying now to play the new game because they know they're caught, and now they're trying to play it your on your sympathy or hey, see, I, 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 you know, I know I've done bad things, but I want to, I have remorse, which they don't. So they never do it. On, they never confess or 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 uh, give themselves up because they feel bad. Oh, nonsense! Absolute nonsense. Um, and John John Tench tries to convince Holden that Kemper is using him for whatever reasons he had. Well, absolutely. Do you think? Do you think a serial killer is letting you interview him because he wants to help your research project? <laughs> because he cares about helping uh, the police catch serial killers? Hell no. I mean, they're there because they're playing you. They're manipulating you. They're getting something out of it. It could be that they're amused by you. It could be that they want to get a book written about them. Or maybe they want to get in a movie. Hey, look here. You know, what? what, what what's sitting behind me right now? Oh, wait, it's Ed Kemper. You know, the, the guy play, playing Ed Kemper. So Ed Kemper, someone, hoo hoo, I made Netflix Mindhunter. You betcha they enjoy that. Um, so yeah, they're playing you. And and a lot of times the serial killers will also cl claim that they've committed other crimes that they haven't committed. Why do they do that? Oh, because they want to be, oh, I know where a body's buried. So they can get to go out of the prison, be taken around, they get a McDonald's lunch, 
they're always playing you. It's never about you. It's always about them. So you always have to know what is it they actually want. Um, you can now, mind you, you can also manipulate them and use them if you understand that it's, you know, they're doing the same to you. So you have to play them more than they play you. And you got to be good at it. Um, Kemper, uh, oh, Holden thinks Kemper knows more about lust killings than the whole BSU. Well, okay, so the so the behavioral science unit doesn't know much about guys and the thrill of killing women and having sex with them or raping them, uh, raping them and then killing them or killing them and then raping them. They don't know much, as they don't have the understanding and feeling of how it is to be a serial killer. Well, I hope not. Um, and yeah, of course, Kemper, he does. He's done that. I mean, I don't know anything about fishing because I don't like to fish. Uh, so if I go talk to a fisherman, obviously he's going to know more than me. And if I have to write a book, let's say I was going to write a book and in it was going to have a fisherman. Well, I better darn well do some research because I can't, I'm not going to write a very convincing story about a fisherman like the old man of the sea when I don't know a damn thing about fishing. So consequently, yes, he obviously knows more. And I do not object to them learning from these guys about how they, so, of course they're lying. So you got to understand a lot of times they're lying. So you, you got to know that you're getting played so you, you can take some of it with a grain of salt, but yes, you can learn from it. I mean, there's a point where, you know, having interviewed many of them, you sort of can get a feel for how they operate. And so there's no harm in that. I think it was a good research project. I don't think it needs to be done with every single serial killer that ever walked because it gets repetitive, but that they did this and got some understanding of it, uh, you know, I'm okay with that. I just don't think you're ever gonna get to the, any quote motive or that it's gonna help you catch them that, that well, because we're still talking about, evidence at the crime scene linking back to somebody and not just saying, oh, it's a white guy in his fifties. And, you know, he's got a car that's, you know, an old car. I mean, that, that really, quite frankly, if you can't get that from the crime scene, you're just making that stuff up. Um, so uh, let's see what we got here. Um, oh, Kem <laughs> uh, Kemper called killing women a vocation. Yeah. Basically it is vocation for, for a person like him. Uh, that's his thing. It's, it's, I could call it a hobby, but it's what he's into. Um, and so, that's what his life's about. So yeah, it's a vocation. And Kemper also tells Holden stuff, oh, that makes his skin crawl. And Holden thinks maybe he's getting into his psyche. Well, you know, if, if, if you're talking to a serial killer and, and they're getting into your brain, you, you probably need to step away um, because, I mean, you should be able to listen to them. I mean, the stories, are, they're, they're, it's not pleasant. I mean, bring it to a homicide detective isn't pleasant. You see horrible things at the scene. You see blood, you see bodies, you see people cut up. You see, hor you deal, you have to interview horrible people. That's what detectives do all the time. No, actually they're, they have much more stress than a profile. So when profiles tell me, oh, or they write about, oh my God, I got them, oh, God, oh, it's such torture. I'm like, no, you should be on the scene as a, as an actual police detective, as a homicide detective, you have to walk in, you get to look at that dead child that somebody raped and murdered. And you you got to deal directly with the family. That is that gets into your brain. Not not the not the not the mind of the killer, but just the, the horror that the killer has created. And as a profiler, you know, I don't go to the fresh scene. And I'm looking at photos and I yes, I have talked to a serial killer or two, <laughs> and I have talked to the families, but the but that, that's not going to get into my mind the way de a, a detective dealing with a scene. So I'm not going to sit here and whine because once you know what a homicide detective goes through, you can, you can just shut up about whining. So any FBI profiler or other profiler who writes about how they're having some kind of mental collapse and they can't deal with it. Sorry, shut up. Just shut up. Um, it annoys me. Um, so uh, the other thing, well, the one thing I thought was kind of amusing in, in the show was that they um, they're going to different scenes. Uh, they're 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 traveling around teaching, uh, and and here 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 we have them. They're they're in, they're in the restaurant teaching. I mean they're in the restaurant eating here. So they're they're having their little coffees and things. And they're on the road and they're like exhausted. They're going from class to class to class. Look, I say I've done that. That is torture. I mean, I'd rather interview serial killers than, than go from town to town teaching these classes. It's really wearing. So I think sometimes when 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 John Douglas complained that he, he eventually said he collapsed, and we see this in the end of the series, this collapse of Holden, um, where he has this panic attack and ends up in the hospital. This is something also true. For, this was what John Douglas claimed happened to him. He had this. They suddenly just had like collapsed in his hotel room and almost died, and. I'm just going to say it's the it's not it's not the serial killers it's your lifestyle it's being on the road all uh, for as long oh my god for 
being on the road forever, probably drinking too much, eating too much, whatever you're doing, but you're exhausted. So that's what it's really about. It's not, it's not the, the serial killers getting into your dang head. That's uh, just nonsense. So then we go on. Let's see. Um, what is our next one here? Okay. Okay. Oh, then we're going to bring in, let me, let me step over here. Um, so episode two, Kemper, 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 just great, just great. In episode three, we get to Wendy Carr. She represents Ann Burgess, the woman who was involved in the project. Um, <laughs> um, so, uh, so anyway, she does mention, um, she, she's a psychologist and that, and she wants to get into the minds of all these killers too. And she talks about the first book really written about that. And that was called um, Mask of Sanity. That's Mask of Sanity. It's a really old. It's one of the first books I ever bought, which is what it's like forty years old now. Uh, Her, by Hervey Hervey Cleckley, excellent, excellent book. One of the first things ever really getting into the minds of killers. Uh, if you're into this, let me just show you a couple more. Robert Hare wrote Without Conscience, a fabulous book about psychopaths, and my absolute favorite beats all of the stuff I ever saw coming out. Inside the Criminal Mind by Stanton Samenow. He used to work at uh, Saint Elizabeth's Hospital here in Washington D.C. I wrote something about. Um, that I didn't believe a bit in um, uh, 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 when people just uh, you know, s snap and then do something terrible. And so I got attacked on TV for saying that. Oh, how can you say that? And then I got this wonderful uh, um, uh, email from Stanton Salmonow saying, good for you. <laughs> and I love his work because I, he really, really does understand the criminal mind. And he's, he, he, he doesn't, he's not fooled by it. And so he really, and he worked trying to do it with rehabilitation issues. And he's like, certain things you can't rehabilitate. You just have to manipulate. So just best book ever. Uh, it's my book. And if you really want to know how serial killers think, here's a really creepy ass book. It's called Killer Fiction. This guy was a, was a police officer and he was a, was a serial killer. One of the rare ones that made it on the police force and actually was a serial killer. Creepiest book ever. This is not a book. This is not books. This is not, um, this, he's not describing his crimes. He's doing fiction. So he tells has all these creepy stories about fictionalized crimes, which are full of rape and murder and perversion. And this is this oh, what a creepy bunch of crap that is. But and it's, I don't I don't think he should get any money from it. By the way, but man, it does tell you what kind of creep he was and how his sick little mind enjoyed what he did. So I do like that one. Now back to, back to car here. Oh my God. Um, wow. Uh, she said one thing I liked. I, I have to admit, I didn't like her. I really disliked this woman in the show. Um, I thought she was noxious. I thought she was arrogant. I thought she was irritating. Uh, she was like always fighting the men like she had to prove she was better than them. Um, and she's working in a man's field. Nah. And and they and they portrayed her as a lesbian, which is fine. Uh, now Ann Burgess wasn't, and Ann Burgess actually laughed about that because she goes, "Okay, well, I don't care if they portray me that way because she's still a fictional character." But you know, um, so I'm okay with that. But the problem I had with it was in the first at least the whole of season one, I didn't see any point to that at all. That was like they didn't show her really in any really good relationships or any. I don't know. I didn't even see what just they just said that. Okay, it's 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 it to me was okay. You, it doesn't, it didn't matter. It really didn't matter, but they wanted, I think they're trying to take each character and make something unique about them. So she, she happens to be gay. Okay. That's cool. Um, I don't mind her for that. I mind her for everything else. <laughs> being gay is cool. Being whoever she is, is she's an unpleasant human being in this whole show. And I just want to punch her in the face every time I saw her. Um, she said a few good things, but a lot of stuff she said in the show was nonsense. And now, uh, Ann Burgess was a, uh, she was a nurse. She was not a psychologist. She worked a nurse and she worked with rape victims and, and she wanted to understand how rape, you know, what the rape victims were had to deal with and, and to help them. And by, and that's why she also wanted to understand the other side of it so that she could really, really, you know, help with these, you know, catching these guys and also keeping them away from these women and what the women went through as well. I really love Ann Burgess. I think she's fabulous. And I just don't think Wendy Carr represented her well. I just think, wow, I would be, if I were Ann Burgess, I'd be kind of going, thanks a lot, lady. Uh, <laughs> so I didn't like a lot of what she did. Um, and some of the stuff she did was just complete making up stuff that I know Ann Burgess never probably did. Anyway, one of the things she said, which was correct, Wendy Carr, in the show. N narcissists don't go to the doctor. Psychopaths are convinced there's nothing wrong with them. So these men are virtually impossible to study, but you found a way to study them in near perfect laboratory conditions. Now, this is true. Psy 
psych psychopaths do not think anything's wrong with us, so they are not going to go to a a, a, a psychiatrist for any reason. And that's why I found funny in um, uh, Silence of the Lambs that Buffalo Bill was supposedly went to the psychiatrist, right? He, he went, you know, and I'm like, no, he wouldn't have gone to him uh, because he wouldn't have thought anything was wrong with him. He's per perfectly fine. So you can't study them through psych through through a psychologist usually and, and because they're not trying to get help. So yes, they're in prison. That's the, that is a good place to study them because they're not going any place and they might see you because they're bored. So yes. So anyway, and they go, okay. So the first, the, one of the first crimes they do, they get to Sacramento and they see new crime, these photos of an old lady and a dog killing. And so that was really weird. So they, they guess maybe he's a teen. And then they, then they guess, oh, maybe he's older and living with his mother, maybe married. They just start making up stuff. Uh, oh no, he's poor white right trash because blacks and Latinos are too respectful of older women to kill them. <laughs> if you're a psychopath, I don't think it matters what race you are. You, you happy to kill all kinds of people, including old ladies. So that is just such nonsense. I just like, what the heck? What kind of crap is that? So anyway, they, they end up helping solve this crime supposedly. But what really happened was the dude came by talking to the police and the police had to investigate him because obviously if you talk to them, they're going to go out to his house. Oh, and lo and behold, there's a piece of white trash that lived in a crappy house. And he has weird mother issues supposedly. And so then the police chief says, oh, Holden, you're the modern day Sherlock Holmes and John Trench, you're Dr. Watson. I kind of thought that was funny because, you know, again, uh, uh, Holden, John Douglas wins out to be the, 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 the actual profiler and, and John Trench, who represents wrestler, gets to be his psychic. Ah, I thought that was kind of funny. Uh, so, but anyway, not, that was not even true because Sherlock Holmes used deductive profiling, which is what I use. And basing everything on evidence, and as I pointed out, FBI profile issues, inductive, which is there was nothing about the old woman and the dog that would have led them to that suspect. Not at all. Um, a lot of times when elderly women are killed, it often is a teen living nearby because simple fact is they're easy targets. Uh, the teen doesn't have a car um, and they're easy to handle. So, yes, you might look into a teen nearby because of the, you know, th that would make sense. Um because especially she's killed in her house. Uh, but, you know, other than that, you're not going to be able to tell that he's poor white trash and that he lives with his mother, you know, someplace else. Just, uh, no, that you could guess that, but he could be living with his girlfriend. He could be living in a rooming house, you know. So, and then they, that funny thing is the chief, she goes, you're either, you're either like Sherlock Holmes or you're psychic. I'm like, mm, maybe they're working on the psychic thing, making stuff up. Um, which, you know, profiles that match half the population, you're going to be half the time right. Um, Kemper said one thing in this thing too. He said he likes winning over death. And that's absolutely true. That's what serial killers love winning over death because it makes them God. He said they were dead and I was alive. I was the hunter and they were my victims. Bingo, bingo. It's like being a hunter. And some people who hunt, now you're going to get a lot of arguments from hunters on this. I just went for the meat, but people like hunting. A lot of people like the act of killing an animal and being the one who kills it. Uh, it is kind of a cheap thrill. And I'm not going to get into whether I think hunting is bad or good. It's just simple fact that, I mean, if you're, if you're, you're, you're living in a day and age where hunting is the only way you're going to survive, then you hunt regardless. But if you're hunting when you could go to the store, you've probably got some other issue. Uh, you like hunting. <laughs> so, so Kemper is simply saying, Hey, they, I got to be the hunter and I killed them and they're dead. I'm still here. You know, I feel great. Uh, Kemper then blames his mother for her death. He says she was annoying and then he she talked so much blah, 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 that he killed her and then he put her vocal cords in the garbage disposal to shut her up. Now, I don't know if his mother truly was an issue. I mean, she may have been an annoying mother. She, she may have talked too much. But again, he's blaming the he's blaming the victim and serial killers love to blame the victim. It's like, all I was going to do was try to sell her some encyclopedias. I knocked on the door and then the bitch opened it up and, and, and cussed at me. So I punched her. No, maybe you were just planning to punch her when she opened the door and now you're going to claim it was her fault. Or um, there was a guy um, in a crime uh, local to me and he said that he killed the guy because the guy made a pass at him. Well, the funny thing was, as far as anybody knew, the guy was heterosexual. Now he may not have been, or he may have been by, I don't know, but there's no proof that the guy ever made a pass at him, but he used that. He goes, I killed the guy because he made a pass at me and sexually touched me. And you, the guy's dead. He can't even say that never happened. The guy just, the guy wanted to kill me. Uh, so, you know, you can't believe a psychopath. They'll say whatever they want to say. But I'll tell you this, Kemper did enjoy putting his mother's vocal cords down the, the drain and making the joke that shut her up. 
because he had a good sense of humor. Um, and then he said, uh, that my favorite thing at the end was pizza, <laughs> because pizza came and he smiled, pizza. And it's a very, one of the things I say about um, serial killers is, and psychopaths is they can, they can change their tune in three seconds. So they can kill somebody and then go buy a hamburger and go home and look like they haven't done anything bad. Um, hamburgers. Oh, cool girl, hamburgers. So uh, that's normal. And then could they show the guy sitting there eating pizza? And uh, and I have to admit, that's kind of funny in a sad way that, you know, a lot of times I've been working on looking at crime scene photos and I can eat pizza at the same time. So it's kind of, you get a little numb. So you can do that. Um, and then Holden says, I can't let these guys rub off on me. Well, hey, stop it. You know, you're having issues. Um, so then let's go on episode four. Um, okay, next guy was Monty Russell. Rissell, sorry, say the guy's name wrong. Monty Rissell. Where is Monty Rissell? Which guy? Is it this guy? Okay. I think this is it. I have trouble seeing on my screen here. If I got to Mon I didn't get to Monty Rissell. Hold on one second. Got to get rid of Randy Carr. Monty Rissell. Okay. They do Monty Rissell. And this was kind of interesting. He says he let one girl go because he felt merciful toward her. Oh, bull. There was something else that got in his way. Crap. So John Trench, Trench says, oh, come on. You don't expect us to believe that. And, it, and that was the end of the interview. Holden's frustrated and all about that. And then they discuss, you know, how even if they lie, you should keep going with the interview. And that's true. I mean, they're going to lie to you and you're just going to listen to it and smirk and know that they're lying because that's what you want to find out. How much, how much of a bullshit artist are you? Uh, and then, so anyway, um, they discuss what set Russell, Russ, Russell off with the first victim, why he killed her. And, but whatever they make their determinations, this is my point, is it doesn't matter what his actions were. They cannot determine why he did it. That's crap. This is the motive thing again. Why did he actually do that? Well, because he wanted to kill a woman. That's it, you know. And then they started developing categories along the way. And that's what turned into the crime classification manual. Categories were why people did what they did. So they gave them a name. They started with organized and disorganized. Like a smart guy was organized and a, a, a disorganized guy was not so smart. And God, am I one of the most disorganized people I know. So I'm screwed. I mean, I guess... I'm not very smart, <laughs> you know, and what it really comes down to is there are people who I call it fast and slow. Some people are, are are very meticulous. It's not that they're smarter. They're just meticulous. And they're, they like to do things in a very slow fashion. They like to kill slowly. They like to keep people in their dungeons. They like to torture people. And then some people are like, oh, it's too much damn work. I just want to kill that. I just want to kill that broad. You know, I want to rape and kill her and have my thrill, you know, and there, people are different. And, uh, you know, if I were a serial killer, I suppose I'd be the disorganized fast guy because I don't have that much patience. So, <laughs> yeah, and we all have our thing. Um, but I know I, the cat, and then they had this category called mixed. Mixed, the mixed category was, well, we're not sure if he's organized or disorganized. We'll call him mixed. Okay. So I, I'm not too fond of those categories. I, I do think that if you find a crime scene that very meticulous, you're going to find a meticulous person. That is evidence-based. If you find a crime scene is a complete freaking mess and the guy drops stuff, you're probably going to find a guy who's sloppy. I'm not going to go with organized and disorganized. He's just sloppy. And so you, when you go to his house, it's probably going to be a sloppy house and the meticulous guy is going to have a very nice, neat house. But that's based exactly on the evidence at the scene. So I, I, that I can go with. Um, so, But I don't go with high intelligence, low intelligence. That's nonsense. Now... Let's see. Well, Carr says in this, Wendy Carr, who is supposed to be Ann Burgess, says serial killers have to believe their stories of how their past made them do it because if they believe they did it for fun and pleasure, it would destroy them. <laughs> Nonsense. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Totally disagree. Um, they know exactly what they did and they're proud of it. I mean, they're, they're not trying to pretend there's something that they're not. They're telling you that because they want you to be fooled. But dang, they, they, they like what they do and they're not feeling a bit guilty about it and they don't have to blame their past on it, but they'll tell you that. So that's just nonsense. Um, and, that, no, and then Carr says, this is this is like like the world's stupidest. Oh, they, they end up committing this crime because of their past, this horrible ho sexual homicide. And then they have to erase the only witness, which means they have to do the whole thing over again. I guess they're the only witness, and so they only commit more crimes because, what? I don't even understand that crap. You know, you commit more crimes because guess what? It was fun the first time. It's going to be fun the second time. Maybe even more fun the third time. That's why you do it. So 
Yeah. Then she talks about crazy, angry mother and an absent father. Well, there's a truth to that to some extent that a household that sometimes has an absent father and a mother who's taking doing doing everything uh, sometimes does create a bad bad environment for the child. But there are a lot of people who grow up with that and they turn out fine. So then Holden and the uh, uh, Holden um, and John go to a perplexing case in Pennsylvania where a set of clues leads in multiple directions and leaves no shortage of suspects. This is called Beverly Jean. It's in Altoona, Pennsylvania. And these are based on, these cases are based on real cases, but this one, I, 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 the real case makes sense. And this is nonsense. And I'm watching this going, what, what? And then I finally looked it up and went, oh yeah, that makes sense. So anyway, this is what happens. Um, uh, so let me, let me see if we go here. Okay, so, wait a minute, I've got a different person here. Hold on, Beverly. Okay, yeah, Beverly Jean show. Okay, so anyway, so what happened was she was murdered and then when she was found in a dump and her breasts were cut off her body after she was dead. She was badly beaten and stab, stab, stabbed multiple times. So then we go on <laughs> and they first suspect maybe maybe it's this guy that oh, he was, he saw her that night at some bar or something. And then they, because they, they thought maybe it was a drifter and it turned out they they thought, well, okay, it's not him. And then they thought maybe it's a fiance, but they interviewed him and said, why would the fiance is about to marry her commit this crazy crime like this? So then the way the crime turns out is this. Okay, so this is how the murder, murder went down. And this is how Wendy Carr explains it without any proof, mind you. Betty Jean was murdered this way. Frank, the brother-in-law and the wife of the new baby, so the she, so so let me see here. So the fiance had a, a brother-in-law who was named Frank, and that was and his sister who was the wife, right? Okay, and they had a new baby. But Frank, the brother-in-law's history of violence, he rapes Betty, which makes Betty's fiance blame her, like in front of him. And then Frank's wife shows up, and they all kill her. Her body is dumped, and the fiance goes back a few days and cuts her breasts off because he can't let go. What? Um, so basically this is huge. Supposedly the sister eventually breaks down and says she saw the girl alive in the bathtub with blood everywhere. And then she kind of helps knock her off the rest of the way. And <laughs> so, so some, some other all in on killing the girl for different reasons. Right. And I'm like, that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. What, who does that kind of crap? So I looked up the real case. The real case is this. So this girl had a boyfriend and she broke up, she broke up with him. And you know, one of the most dangerous things a woman can do is then after she's broken up with him, then go hang out with him. You know, like, oh, let's talk. So anyway, she agreed to talk with him and they went to some like forest forest type area, woods kind of park like area. And, I, and her sister was, was her sister, I think it was the sister was also with, with them. And so anyway, what happened was she went off to talk with the boyfriend and the boyfriend killed her. And then the sister came and then they were like, what do we do with her? I think it might've been a third, another person involved too. And they all said, oh shit, you know, he, he killed her. You know, the other two didn't kill her. This the one guy killed her. And then they were all there. So then they thought, what do we do with her? And they took and dumped her. And then the, the, the guy who killed her did come back and mutilate her, which because he's already a nasty psychopath, right? So he wants to go back and say, ha ha, look what I did to you. Um, but the other two only were involved because they were in the vicinity because the guy had walked off with the girl and killed her while they had all driven out there in the car. Now they're freaked. They're going to go to prison. So they helped. They helped dump the body. But they too weren't too were all weren't all in on the killing. And that just is the stupidest scene I ever heard. And Wendy Carr make and then she Wendy Carr's just making up the stuff. And then this happened. And then that happened. This wasn't in a confession. She just made the crap up. And I'm like, that is exactly what's wrong with inductive profiling. Is if you're just going to make up a scenario in your head, you're not even based on evidence as you, you think psychologically that's what happened that's nonsense and amber just believe me i don't think amber just ever did that um so so anyway the prosecutor eventually only in this in this story only uh, uh, uh takes the gets a fiance uh and uh holden gets all bent out of shape because he said well you know uh, what is him and it's like because the prosecutor says all we got you know everything else is circumstantial and then and then holden gets mad and said you're calling my evidence circumstantial well yeah because you don't have any you don't have any evidence. You're making stuff up. You're giving a profile. Profile doesn't belong in court convicting somebody. A profile is for further investigation. You analyze the crime and you use the analysis to decide what other leads you're going to follow so you can get more evidence, enough evidence to prosecute. You don't put your profile in court and say, because I think he did it and this is why he did it. Therefore, he should be convicted. That is absolute nonsense. So 
that that's really bad. Actually, it was an incident at Ohio court. I worked on a case and John Douglas was pissed off at that court because he did want his, the, the judge threw his profile out of court on that case. And he was all huffy about that because he thought his, it, it should be, it should be accepted, which it shouldn't be. Uh, okay. So let's go to episode six. Now we get to Brutus. Oh, Brutus. Whew. Yeah. Brutus. Um, and he's just creepy as crap. I mean, that guy's just nasty. Just playing outright nasty, and which is pretty reasonable. Um, and the one, the fun, funny part was though when Bruto says, "Oh, you know, I heard through the grapevine that Kemp, Kemper thought you were morons, and and believed all the shit he said." And there was never any evidence that that was even true. But hey, who's lying? Is is Bruto's lying? Bruto's lying, or is Kemper lying? Who knows? But it's pretty funny. Anyway, uh, I thought it was funny. And then it's one thing Tench said was to. Uh, to John, he's like, if what we're doing doesn't get under your skin, you're either more screwed up than I thought, or you're kidding yourself. And of course, that's sort of setting up for this kind of breakdown he has that uh, that Holden's going to have at the end. Uh, does it get to you? Well, it's 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 pretty unpleasant, and you have to balance your life. If you work in an unpleasant field, you need to, need to balance your life. And people have asked me that question. I'm like, no, I balance my life. I have friends. I have family. I travel. I love music. I love dance. I love art. I love you know all kinds of things that aren't to do with homicide. <laughs> so I don't, you don't, you have to balance your life out. Um, and let's see, uh, let me have some, let's see here. Oh, we have, oh, now, now we have, we have them fantasizing about what Brutus probably thought and did. Again, you know, stop trying to get in the head of Brutus. Brutus is a sick fuck. Uh, am I? Is, oh, I can do that on YouTube, okay. I'm, I'm not, you know, I've done so many years of, 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 uh, of national television. I wouldn't get away with that, but he was, that's what exactly what he was. So let's face it. He's a creepy dude. Um, but anyway, uh, so now let's go now on to episode seven. Oh no. Uh, episodes more, more Brutos. Um, episode eight. And I'll hold it goes back to Brutos alone. She starts a new technique. Now this has some validity. He said, if you didn't do it, how do you think the guy did it? You know, it's not a bad method. Was that Brutus he went back to? Or was that? Hmm. Yeah, maybe it was Brutus. Uh, and so this is a method where the, the killer isn't going to maybe admit what he did. But you can use this like before they're even they're even caught. Let's say you have a suspect in there and you're talking with them. And you're like, well, you know, you didn't do it. What do you think? What kind of guy would you think would have done this? Sometimes they'll actually like tell you this fantasy scene, which actually has elements of what they did, because you, it's really hard to create something completely outside of your, you know, knowledge. As I pointed out before, you, you usually have to have some knowledge to be able to create. Now, either you've had to research it to get the knowledge. If you're just making it up on the spot, either you watched a whole lot of serial killer movies, or you may be one of them. And so this is actually not a bad technique. What do you think that guy did? And, and sometimes they'll even get a kick out of telling you that because they're not they're, they're, they, they believe that they're not putting themselves in trouble because they're making a story up about somebody else, but they get a kick out of telling what they did because it's exciting because nobody gets to see what you do when you're a serial killer. Most of the time, you know, it was really cool. You know, I, I, I jumped out and I raped this girl. I was awesome. And her eyes poked out and that was fun. And I bashed her head in and the blood bleh, it was great. And now I can't go to the bar afterwards and say, hey, Joe, guess what I just did? Beat the crap out of this woman. Man, man, you should have seen her head split open. You can't go to the bar, can't go to a cocktail party and say these things. So you have to, you can't tell anybody basically. So you can tell it in a fantasy version or you can tell it after you get arrested. But those are two methods. But it is a good method for for uh, getting gathering information. That's not so bad at all. Um, and... Now, then, then I want to point out here that, that what you so say, if you can get him to confess a certain thing that might get you more evidence and then you can put him in a bind, then you might be able to get him to uh, confess to something because he'll think, oh, I need to get a, a good deal out of this because now they know more about me. Uh, so they give a little information. You manage to find more evidence based on that information. And then they're like, and then they might say, OK, I did it because now. I'm going to make up a story about how I did it. So maybe I won't get murder one. I'll get, oh, she she attacked me. Therefore, I defended myself. Nonsense. It's a, it's a very tricky little situation. Uh, then, they, then, then there's this thing about recruiting in this one. They have a great new recruit who is black. But Carr says, because most of the killers are white, it would affect their responses. So you don't want to send a black guy in to talk to a white guy because they don't really want to talk to a white guy. But here's what's interesting to me. The FBI was one of 
it was the major reason we always believed that so many serial killers were uh, but serial killers were white. That was always a white guy did it. A white guy did it. So serial killers are all white guys. And that was the biggest bunch of bull because serial killers come in all races and they're in all cultures. So there have been many, many black serial killers in, in, in the United States. And the simple reason we didn't hear about them is because the FBI didn't go interview them. Why not? Why didn't the interview, they, why did the FBI interview them? Now there's, there's a couple reasons. One is, there are less caught. And the reason some of them are less caught is because if they're living in, in you know, there's a lot of, you know, if you're living in, let's say, a, a particularly um, uh, urban area where there is a higher percentage of African Americans in the urban area, and there's a fairly cri high crime areas, therefore the police are busy and they don't really notice what's going on with a dead woman here, a dead woman there, whatever they're doing, because they're overwhelmed with cases. Um, it's just a lot of work. Uh, in more rural areas it, or in suburban areas, if somebody gets knocked off, the, there's more focus from the police on that particular case. Uh, so may, it's, it is true that probably some black serial kills have gotten away with it more simply because the investigation wasn't as strong. Some people say it's because they didn't give a crap about the women that were killed. And in certain parts of, you know, what if they say it's prostitutes, drug addicts, um, depending on who they're picked on, uh, maybe there is less interest. Uh, not that they, it's just, you know, maybe there's less evidence even too. So it's like, it's just harder to, it's harder to figure it out. Let's face it. So there, I think less, there were less black serial killers in prison at a certain time, but you know, I don't, if you've listened to any of the recent years, you'll see there's a lot of black serial killers been caught, but they weren't interviewed. I mean, and that's the other, they were there probably, and they just weren't interviewed by the FBI. So it gave this really skewed idea that, you know, uh, all serial killers were white. Um, the other thing that happens too is sometimes people are serial killers, but they because they can't link the other crimes to them, they only have one crime or two crimes. They won't call them serial killers. They will be, but they won't call them that. So therefore, they don't. They're not included in the study. Um, and then there was this one thing about this tick, this principle, which I didn't think was necessary. In there, but he tickles feet of the children, and he's creepy. So anyway, Holden gets gets obsessed with it and ends up basically getting the guy fired. Um, which he should have been for tickling children's feet. It wasn't harmless, it's creepy. And people ask you to stop and you won't stop it. You may not be a serial killer, but you're a creepy dude. And you you are also manipulative and you're disrespectful because you won't stop doing what people are that find uncomfortable. Just because you think it's cool, doesn't mean other people think it's cool. So I don't care what your behavior is. If you keep doing it to people who don't like it and to children who do not like it and the parents do not like it, you deserve to be disappeared out of your job. But uh, apparently Holden feels bad about it because he gets fired and like, I feel really bad. The wife came to me and said, you're terrible. He's been a wonderful principal for all these years and you ruined his life. Well, I'm sorry, the principal ruined his own damn life. Uh, so I didn't have any feeling for that at all. Um, let's see what else we got. Oh, okay. Episode nine. Let's talk about uh, spec. That's back. Wait a minute. Am I missing somebody here? Sometimes it's hard to see on these these photos. Um, oh, now we're that's we're back. To, isn't that Brutus again? Wait a minute. Where's Speck? Oh, here he is. I'm sorry. I'm going backwards. Okay, Speck. Uh, that Richard Speck is the guy that killed not the eight nurses in one night and kind of more like a mass murderer than a serial killer, but he raped one, of, raped them too. So yeah, uh, he he's a he's kind of a weird dude. Uh, has really weird things that happen. Uh, anyway, he got caught really quick after that. Um, he, he was caught. He was identified by another drifter. You know, no, but no profiling in this. Just he got identified and that was him. So anyway, the whole thing of the story is that makes him creepy. As far as nasty, he is a nasty guy. And uh, one of the things he said, uh, the whole the whole line was just great. So he's got this little bird in his hand and he's feeding the little baby bird. And he goes, no, he's not feeding it, but he's petting it. And he tells them that he was feeding it meatloaf through an eyedropper. And he's holding his hand through the entire interview. And at the end of the interview, he gets pissed off. At what I forgot which one of the agents pissed him off, whether it was John or Holden. Anyway, they pissed him off, and and he says, and they asked. He said they asked him why, why, why the women he killed, why, why did these women? You know, you killed these women. Why should these women have died? And he takes the bird and he chucks it into his this fan, and it kills the bird instantly. And he goes, it just wasn't their fucking night. And I, I think that is so accurate. And, and when people ask, well, how is, you know, he was caring for this little bird. So he had this kindness. No, no. The bird amused him. The bird amused him. The power he had over the bird to make it well, but he also had the power to kill it in a second too. That's how little empathy actually had. He didn't love the bird. He loved taking, having power over the bird. And the same thing as the women. He has no empathy whatsoever. Just done. Um, 
There was a great comment by Clifford Olson. It's Clifford Olson. I, I, I'm not sure I have the right, right, right way. I think it's Clifford Olson. He's a Canadian serial killer. He killed a bunch of children. And somebody, they came to him and said, you know, you could give the parents some some sense of, uh, you know, a closure if you could just tell where their, their children's bodies are buried. And he said, if I gave a damn about the uh, parents, I wouldn't have killed their children. I think that that sums it up, doesn't it? If I cared about the parents, I wouldn't have killed their children. <laughs> like, well, that's a good point. Good point. And that's that's kind of what, what we see here with spec too. Okay, so now we have this one case, this case, oh my goodness. Okay, so we have this case, next case. It's, it's uh, Dawn, this is, this is, uh, we're on episode nine. This is Dawn Porter case, uh, in this one, Lisa Dawn Porter. She's a good, she was a, she was a majorette. She was like 12 years old. She's a virgin. She's a good girl. And they found her raped and, and murdered. And the guy allowed her to dress hurriedly and, then they started saying, well, maybe because, let her dress because it, was, it wasn't planning to hurt her. And then, he, you know, and uh, maybe wanted her to, you know, dress because so he wasn't ashamed of what he did. Maybe he thought she was having fun and then to let her get dressed. And then then he then he then he killed her and then he put a coat over her face because he felt ashamed. And all this ashamed stuff is nonsense. You know, if you're and that's been a big thing, putting putting clothes, you know, covering up a uh, a, a victim makes you supposedly, you know, you don't feel like you did this bad thing. I'm sorry. You know what I always thought it was? It's like, you don't not worth even looking at. Let me just cover you up. Cause that's all you are. You're nothing. I mean, we're talking about a psychopath. He has no empathy and he doesn't feel guilt. So why would he do that? I mean, why make it what it isn't? Um, and who knows why? Maybe just drop the coat there. You know, you're again, imagining things in, in your head. So anyway, they, they start trying to profile this crime and, and supposedly they come up with this clever profile. Now, mind you, um, there was actually, this is based on a true case and this is John Douglas case. And let me tell you, I have had some experience with John Douglas cases where I believe he got inside information. In other words, I already had the suspect and then he came up with the, the, the profile at that point and then said, oh yeah, matches your suspect. There was a case where he said that the suspect, that when they found him, they would find he had a stutter. And I'm like, there is absolutely no way you can find from a crime scene that a guy has a stutter. And there are so many crime scenes that look just like the one he profiled and none of the other guys had a stutter. So why would this one guy have a, a stutter? Well, what happened was somebody called him up and said, hey, we got this guy with a stutter. <laughs> what do you think? Do you think he's the guy? And then he profiled and then added in stutter. And somehow nobody ever calls him out on this. So anyway, this is another one of these cases. So supposedly he he profiles this as being someone may, mid to late 20s um, that... Uh, that um let's see he probably knew the area and that what was his what was his um and he, he came up with what car he drove and oh, what was else the thing he came up with this um yeah he, he, so he had this he had this uh so he gave, came up with this profile that was amazingly apparently what went from the real story is that the, the police chief called him up or the detective from down there called him up and asked him, what do you, what profile do you have? And he gave this profile. And then when they caught the guy, they said, Oh my God, it's just like what you said. But what reality happened in the crime and it, it's shown a little bit here um, is that the, the guy was working on, on, on the trees and the lines right above, right where she was, 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 was abducted. And he told two different people at two different times that he liked to screw that girl and make comments about that girl with a derogative and what he wanted to do to her. So when the police came around and said, is anything strange? They're like, yeah, this guy we work with is creepy as hell. And he said this about that girl. And then somebody else actually saw his car driving away with the girl. So guess how quickly they took to find him? Like five minutes. And it was him, of course, because people saw him and he said things. So he was easy to catch. So no profile caught him. And I personally think that they must have given him some of that information and just repeated it in his profile. I just I just don't believe that, you know, they, the fact that they already knew from the moment this happened, from the moment they found her body, they knew who this guy was. They knew what he had said and they knew what car he drove. I'm going to say bullshit on the profile. Um, so then there's this uh, very famous story you also find in, in John Douglas's book. It's a story about the rock. So in this, in, in, in the, uh, in the show, we have Holden that goes down there and he interviews this guy and he puts a rock nearby, the rock with blood on it so that the guy's going to focus on and freak out and he's going to confess. And this is in, this is in Douglas's book, but best guess what? Douglas didn't actually go down and do that. He just recommended to the police 
department that the detective that they do this kind of interview. And here's the reality of it. The majority of time, majority of time, the FBI are not in on the fresh cases because the local police don't really want them there, quite frankly. They want it. That's their case. They're going to deal with it. They're going to do their stuff and they don't want the FBI around. Sometimes when they're going under great pressure, they'll finally, years later with the serial killings that never stop, the public will say, why don't you bring the FBI? In? And they do. It doesn't necessarily help, but they do. And then sometimes they have called the BSU for maybe, maybe you can help us out what kind of guy did this. They might do that. They might ask for some some uh, some ideas on how to interview a, a serial killer. That makes sense. How do I interview a psychopath? Now, if you've interviewed all these guys and you've st seen how they behave, that this is the most useful thing I think the FBI did. Not, not in my opinion, the crime classification manual, which breaks everything up. It's, but I really think what, what benefited everybody was just understanding the how these guys behave and talk so that you can conduct really good interviews and, and see and know when one of them's sitting in front of you, you can start saying, well, that guy's like a lion, like a dog. You start recognizing their behaviors. You're recognizing behaviors, not motives, behaviors. You want to understand the behaviors of serial killers so that you can then recognize them when you're interviewing them and you can interview them well so you can get them to, to talk when they shouldn't because you can trick them because they think they're so smart. You can trick them into stuff, not from guilt, but just because they think they're being smarter than you. I asked one guy who was a suspect, I said, I wanted to know, this is what I wanted to know. Were you at this location on a path? Did you cross, I want to know if you crossed path with a, with the victim. Uh, and the time the victim was attacked was exactly at dusk. And I wanted to know, was he there at dusk? Because he, he had already admitted to being on the path, but I didn't know if he was on the path totally late at night or earlier or when he was on the path. But I asked him, why did you take the path and not the main road? And you know what he did? Well, he wanted to prove why he took the path and not the main road he, because he had already admitted to being honest. He had to come up with a good reason for it rather than I wanted to kill a girl. So he said, oh, well, it's because it was getting dark and I didn't, I, well, no, what, wait, wait, no, no, I'm sorry. Let me, let me go back. Okay, he's halfway down the path. And he cut over to the main road. I've forgotten the story. He was halfway down the path. He was already on the path, but then he cut across a stream, walked through a stream of water up to the main road, which was out of his way. That's why, that's why it was weird. And if he had kept going, it would have run into the girl. So I said, why at that point did you cut through the stream and go up to the main road instead of going straight ahead? And he said, because it was getting dark and I didn't want to be on the path in the dark because it's dangerous. I went, bingo. I just tricked you into admitting you were there at dusk. He thought he was getting out of trouble and I he actually got himself into trouble. That is what you do, you trick them. So so now Holden's in there and he's he's doing he's talking to this guy and supposedly the guy sees the rock and he's like, oh no, they got me, they got me. Look, let's face it, he already knew that they got him. It wasn't the rock that did anything. So, you know, when you're talking to the guy and you, you know, he's been, he's realizing I'm in trouble, they got enough on me, they're gonna, they're gonna get me. Um, then you start playing a new game and you try to get along with them and you, you confess because you think maybe you can confess to something that'll get you out, out, you know, into less, less of a charge. Let's put it that way. That's why sometimes I'll say things like, so what happened is you didn't plan to kill her, but she hit you and then you responded. So in other words, instead of a premeditated crime, it was, you know, you just lost your mind. Maybe you can get it down from first degree to second degree or something like that. And the guy said, okay, yeah, that was it. The girl, she, she tried to bite me and I, I flipped, I hit her and then she broke her neck. Um, so they'll go, they'll, they'll say stuff in order to get themselves out of trouble that sometimes then, you know, that proves they did it, but they already know they're going down. So they're going to confess so they can get something less than they're, they're being accused of. So, um, and then, so let's go to the last scene of 10, which did rather, quite frankly, amuse me. Let me see if I can get it out of the way a little bit. Oh, okay. So now this is where Holden in, 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 in episode 10 goes to, to talk to, he's asked, supposedly Kemper wants to talk to him and says, come to the hospital. And I've, I've tried to kill myself or something like that. So anyway, he goes to the hospital and this is based on actually wrestler, not Douglas. Wrestler once went to talk to, um, I think it was Kemper. And he was in the, talking to him and there was a change of shift of guards. And at that moment, there was really no guard there. And Kemper realized and said, you know, I could just screw your head off and stick it on a table now. And Russell's like, ah, you know, and Russell kept talking to him, like, I keep talking to him, keep talking to him. Hopefully the guard will get back before he kills me. So it was based on a real thing. So anyway, he, you know, in this scene, we have, we have, you know, Kemper gets out of bed and 
what I particularly like about it, if you if you can see this, I, I picked this shot for a reason. Uh, he shakes hands with with um, he shakes hands with Holden, but then he puts he's shaking hands, but then he puts his other hand on top. And that to me was just, oh, it's like, I've got you. I've got you in my grip. I just thought that was really creepy and cool. And then, of course, he gives, then now Holden's like, <laughs> freaking out like a little girl. And, and, uh, which I thought was ridiculous. And you know, they don't belong in this job. And then, then Kemper gives him a big hug and he freaks out. And then he runs out of the place and he has a panic attack and collapses and ends up in the hospital. And that's basically based on John Douglas collapsing in his, in his hotel room from what, for whatever reasons and, and, and being very ill for a very short, for a period of time and maybe needing a rest. And so then at so the end of season 10 is Holden's like a kind of a, a, a freaking mess and uh, he needs a rest. So, but, but for me, uh, so if I'm going to, let me say, I'm going to rate the film. <sighs> the film really truly was to supposed to be totally about John Douglas. Um, and, in a sense, they represented him sort of the way he was, you know, supposedly really into this whole thing. I uh, showed him a little bit arrogant, which I don't know is out of character. Um, but uh, it kind of bugged me that the whole thing was mostly supposed to be about him. So I, I, I'm going to give it like a five, a five for him because you know, he, you know, some of the some of the interviewing was really good. Maybe okay, I'll give I'll give him maybe I'll give him a I'll give him a six. I'll give him a six uh, because the interviewing he did was really well done. Okay, I really liked the interviewing he did. I just didn't like his, the way they presented him personality-wise. Personally, I could have done with all the, the scenes with his girlfriend, which are kind of like, just get him out of there. Um, but I didn't like the way he was represented as being like the guy. And then Robert Ressler was not represented as being the guy who he, Richie really was. Robert Ressler was really the really the strength of this whole thing. So I'm gonna, I'll go, I'll give, you know, it's hard. It's, it's like, I'll give wrestler five just because I misrepresented him so bad, but I actually liked his acting. You know, so you, it's a different thing. It's the representation and the acting. The actor I thought was great. I thought, I liked the way he talked about things, the way he represented that part of wrestler. I didn't like the way that he got to be a, kind of a bum. So, you know, half the time he's just, oh, I'm the, I'm the, I'm the wet blanket and, and holding, oh, he's the one, you know. It's just like, kind of it just annoyed me. Uh, Wendy Carr. I'll give her a two and I'm going to be generous on that. I, I love Ann Burgess. I just thought it was a terrible representation of Ann Burgess. And even if it wasn't representing Ann Burgess, as I said, I just couldn't stand her. She's just the most unpleasant, irritating, horrible character I've ever seen. And she's full of crap in the whole show. So I, I don't understand why they had to misrepresent Ann Burgess that way. I think that was dreadful. Um, and as far as, as the serial killers go, I thought all of them were astoundingly well represented. And Kemper is, I say, he, he takes the cake, but I mean, they are all really well done. I mean, Speck throwing that bird up there, uh, Brutos being disgusting. Uh, and, and you know, all of them, I thought they really represented them well because they actually did base them on something. I'm gonna give them a, they, there we are, 10, 10 for those guys, absolutely fabulous. And therefore, if you're going, what I think of the whole series uh, so far, uh, season one, I'm gonna say I will give season one I will give it, I will give it an eight because the, the killers were so darn good. And I think you could learn a lot just by watching that. And I, 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 it's true you could just watch the real interviews, which I suggest doing that along with this. But um, yeah, uh, I, I didn't, the, you know, I still have my issues with FBI profiling. I always have, so I'm not fond of the profiling methods. I do appreciate the fact that they did the research to at least get going some of the, you know, basic, you know, so they could see the serial killer's minds in action and their, the way they talk and the way they behave. I'm good with that. Uh, the the class, crime classification manual, I think goes, it's more of, I say more of an MO than I, the motive thing. So I think, I think this book is fine for learning about MO and how they behave. Um, I'm not so sure I go for all the background stuff on it. Um, there's, so there's a lot of things you can read up on to learn more about what this is about. I hope you check out some of the books that I put up here um, and check out my book, The Profiler, uh, and say and see, they say there's gonna, you're gonna see two different sides of opinions on that book, um, but do check it out. And before I go, don't forget to like, and don't forget to subscribe. I do wanna uh, be able to put more content out for you about serial killers and profiling. And, and really bring a lot of truth to you because I think a lot of times we haven't actually had somebody just come straight forward and say what, what's really going on because it, so much time is what 
you know, put the creepy music on and build it all up and make us all the profilers be mystical creatures, you know, and, and psychic and they're just, and they're chasing people and they're in danger. And then none of this is true. <laughs> and really profilers do crime scene analysis. That's what they should do. That's what detectives do. So the real profilers in the world are the detectives on the cases. And my hope for the future is that I can provide a work. I'm working on providing a better methodology so that the detectives themselves can do better profiling. Uh, and that's it. I mean, uh, we nice that there were like true deductive profiles in every police department so they could spend extra time staring at all the crime scene photos right in the first 48. I, I'm all for that. Very hard to get that to be done, but maybe someday that will be accomplished. I hope so. So anyway, again, like and subscribe, and uh, I will see you for another Profiling at the Movies in the future. Bye, everybody.